Hello, my name is Richard Kaplan, and on behalf of the Oxford Global Society, I'd like to welcome you to this seminar titled, Why in this time of war, we need diplomacy more than ever. We've organized this webinar to mark the publication of the eighth edition of Sato's Diplomatic Practice, edited by Sir Ivor Roberts, who's joining us today. Sato's Diplomatic Practice has been described as an indispensable guide for anyone working in or studying the field of diplomacy. Sir Ivor, a former British ambassador in Belgrade, Dublin, and Rome, joins us today with three other distinguished former diplomats, Dr. Nolene Hazer, Ambassador Jorge Heine, and Mr. Gaith Al-Omari to discuss what scope there is for diplomacy to play a more effective role today in mediating armed conflict. So let's start with you, Ivor. Um, George Mitchell, Mitchell, the great US peacemaker, once said that diplomacy was 700 days of failure and one of success. But in your view, given what we're witnessing today, are there are some areas of conflict so intractable that no diplomatic solution is possible? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I think diplomacy essentially fails until it succeeds. It's, um, it's the case, I think, that however intractable the problem, it's, <laughs> diplomacy is never condemned to fail, absolutely. But it can take many years and the right personalities in place to make the necessary breakthroughs. And I would say that in no particular order, diplomacy succeeds when it's got clear and realistic goals and uh, when both sides can gain something that they want. When there's trust between the parties or trust in a mediator between the parties, and you've just mentioned George Mitchell, who I'll come back to, I think. And when those doing the negotiating are experienced and knowledgeable, uh, and they need to be as well informed as possible about their opposite numbers, and they need to be backed up by their own governments, uh, unless, of course, they're actually the head of government or, or head of state, as, as uh, depending on the circumstances. And on the other side, diplomacy fails um, I would say it's a result of impossible or inflated demands from one or both sides. And um, in some cases where there's a lack of leverage over the other side uh, or a lack of political will to find solutions. And, um, and this is most important, I think, for diplomats to remember that it can be neglect on the part of diplomats um, and their political superiors of adequately preparing for a negotiation. And an ability to empathize with the other side is important, which, which isn't the same as sympathizing, but is the same as understanding their interests and needs. And, and, and the other thing you need, of course, is a requirement to persist in finding common ground. And that's um, an area where sheer stamina and resilience come into their own. And I'm thinking back to my time of negotiating with the Bosnian Serbs when stamina uh, and resilience were very much required. And above all, perhaps, is the ability to discern where compromise might be possible. When the stakes are, are high, as in, for instance, the Cuban Missile Crisis, where there's the prospect of a world war, and the need for patient and constructive diplomacy is all the greater. And that crisis uh, above all others, I think, demonstrated the importance of direct high-level contact and um, back-channel diplomacy and high-quality intelligence. And it um, also demonstrated the importance of avoiding, which is a very common trait these days, megaphone diplomacy. And however attractive for domestic political consumption, the setting out of red lines, which... Um, which turn out, in fact, to be drawn in shifting sands. And that's a recipe for diplomatic failure, as I think President Obama found in his red lines over the use of chemical weapons by Assad in Syria. In some crises, I should say, diplomacy only succeeds when the two sides have come to the conclusion independently that they're never going to win a military victory. And um, drawing in my own experience, I would say the case of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, the, um, the IRA's long 30-year campaign, which had failed to secure British withdrawal from Northern Ireland, was matched by the British government's perception that the IRA were prepared to carry on their struggle indefinitely and, and had the arms 
and, and means to do so. But in fact, the, the terms which um, which brought about the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, namely a, a role for the Dublin government in the governance of um, the North and power sharing in an elected assembly, had been on offer as early as 1973. And it was tragic that it took till 1998, 25 years later, that the IRA would be brought to accept that they were never going to bomb the British into withdrawal. <clears throat> and the British government, for its part, had, um, had declared that they had no selfish or strategic interest in Ireland. And agreed that it was for the people of Ireland in two parts, respectively, exercise their right of self-determination to bring about uh, a united Ireland, if that was their wish. And uh, as I was saying earlier, because trust between the two sides was so poor, it was essential um, that there should be a third party, and in this case it was the US government, George Mitchell, Bill Clinton, who should be able to mediate between the two. I think that's a, it's a very good example, the Northern Ireland Troubles are a very good example of how a domestic political issue requires a foreign relations or international perspective, which can... Um, be ultimately beneficial and perhaps crucial to a final peace agreement. And the Troubles are also an example of, of how a solution to a long-standing conflict, uh, while apparent at an early stage, may simply require the passage of time and patient reiteration uh, as the parties grow tired of conflict and violence and come to prefer on balance to make the necessary concessions to achieve a, a peace agreement. And I would say that there are obvious parallels to the present crisis in Israel and the Israel-Palestine issue, which which I think we should pay attention to. Um, and it's become a, a sort of commonplace these days to say that uh, diplomats are no longer needed. Heads of state and government enjoy summit meetings because they can get away from tedious, um, tiresome domestic political issues. And um, they like to think that um, they can sum each other up with greater insight and success than professional diplomats. And President Trump in his dealings with um, Kim Jong-un in North Korea, I think, provides a, a classic example of this political hubris. Um, it comes back to the basic questions, which familiar to the observers of Brexit in Britain, of uh, who needs experts? But, um, you know, if we were to ask a similar question about whether you needed to draw up a legal contract or whether you needed someone to carry out brain surgery, you'd be pretty crazy not to get either a lawyer or a surgeon involved. But, I mean, diplomacy's had its share of amateurs. Um, we can think back to Sir Mark Sykes, who negotiated the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916, which divided up the Ottoman Empire with his French opposite number. Uh, but such amateurs can often make complicated and tense situations worse. But where diplomats can, I think, come into their own is um, in gaining knowledge and understanding of the different countries they're posted in to advise their own governments and also, just as important, explain to other countries uh, their own country's position. And the internet, I think, is no substitute for a deep knowledge of the history and culture of another country or region. And although English may be a universal language of the moment, it's a big mistake to assume that everyone who shares a common language has the same assumptions and values. Uh, and lastly, I'd say um, diplomats also need to be aware of the historical context in which they're operating and the particular histories of those they're dealing with. Using comparisons from similar situations in the past can help in working out what is likely to happen. But um, you need always to be careful that these analogies don't always work, but they can be a way of opening up possibilities or offering warnings. But they shouldn't be traps, and diplomats should always be aware of what is different this time round, and they always the circumstances are always different. So overall, I'd say this isn't an easy set of requirements uh, to juggle with. But then, you know, when has diplomacy ever been easy? There would be very little for us diplomats to do if the world consisted of congenial and like-minded partners. Um, and instead, as we've been reminded, there's violent conflict going on in over 30 countries at the moment. So there's plenty of work for us diplomats to do now and in the years to come.
I'll leave it there. Ivor, thank you very, very much for those um, opening remarks. I want to turn now to Dr. Nolene uh, Hazer. Dr. Hazer is a, a former UN Undersecretary General, Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific, ESCAP, Executive Director of the United Nations Development Fund for Women, UNIFEM, and UN Secretary General Special Advisor for Timor-Leste and Special Envoy on, on Myanmar. Nolene, the, the war in, in Gaza uh, is continuing and unabated. I'd like to ask, what is the impact of violence against civilians in Gaza and the long-term implications of this humanitarian tragedy for diplomacy, international institutions, and the principles and norms that they uphold? Quite a large question, I realize. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this very important discussion. The gravity and darkness of our historical moment cannot be overstated. We are bearing witness to atrocities and crimes against humanity conducted with blatant impunity. And we're watching the, the very foundation of global institutions created in the aftermath of World War II, intended to be bastions of global peace and security, crumble under the weight of their failures to end today's wars. From Gaza to Tigray, Myanmar to Afghanistan, Syria to Sudan, the cries of anguish from war zones, occupied territories and communities wounded by structural violence and injustice resound with a sense of urgency that none of us can ignore. The brutality and collective punishment inflicted on civilians are horrific and inhumane. Families torn apart, children, women, and men being killed in the most agonizing ways, homes reduced to rubbles, hospitals being bombed, entire population under siege with little access to food, water, medicine, and fuel, innocent lives forever lost or scarred. International humanitarian law crafted to mitigate these atrocities finds itself violated with alarming frequency. The very rules designed to protect civilians are cast aside, leaving communities shattered and countless lives in ruins. Compounding this tragedy is the absence of a robust mechanism to enforce international humanitarian law and human rights law. law war criminals often evade accountability, perpetuating a cycle of impunity that undermines the very fabric of justice. Despite the cry, never again, the world fails to stop genocide and ethnic cleansing again and again. The international community's inability to ensure compliance weakens the credibility of the rules we establish, exposing the fragility of our commitment to protect the innocent. Diplomacy. Envisioned as the antidote to conflict has failed more often than it has succeeded. The case of Palestine is a tragic example of this failure. Diplomacy, once the beacon of hope, is now stained by broken commitments, double standards, and weak enforcement mechanisms. The breakdown of trust poses a formidable challenge in reviving political processes. How do we rebuild trust when it has been shattered by years of historical injustice, sanctioned violence, and entrenched grievances? To move forward, the international community must acknowledge the failures of the past that have perpetuated sufferings in places like Palestine. It is no longer enough to talk about a two-state solution to end the 56-year occupation, we urgently need to invest in effective diplomacy to create political space and genuine dialogue, to implement a durable end to occupation based on the rights of both Palestinians and Israelis to self-determination and their legitimate security concerns and interests. Diplomacy for peace, is badly needed to manage the fractures and growing hatred, the suffering of all, and secure a just and equitable future 
for Palestinians and Israelis. Trust in any just solution can only be rebuilt if both states are economically, socially, and politically viable. If people see results in their daily lives and a shared interest in creating a successful, a successful future for their children, only then will they have a vested interest in keeping the peace. Now, in the year 2000, as executive director of UNIFEM, I had the privilege of working with women leaders in conflict-affected countries to change the paradigm of peace and security, resulting in Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. Now, it changed the focus from weapon-based security to human security. It criminalized sexual violence as a weapon of war, it addressed the drivers of conflict, the economic, social, and political roots of discrimination and exclusion, as well as the underlying inequalities that rendered women and girls vulnerable. Its four pillars of prevention, protection, participation, peace building, and recovery form the foundation of women's diplomacy for sustainable peace and security. Their emphasis is on inclusive peace processes and having women at the peace table, including women of diverse backgrounds in political decision-making processes that brings a country from war to peace, allows different perspectives to be articulated in critical discussions about social cohesion, accountable institutions, effective governance, and what a peaceful and just society should look like. Now, inspired by 1325, Israeli and Palestinian women leaders wrote an official letter together asking me to convene the International Women's Commission for a Just and Sustainable Palestinian and Israeli Peace based on international law, human rights, and equality. Now, this was a period when the two state solution was on the political table. The women leaders wanted the IWC to bring together Palestinian, Israelis, and international women leaders experience in diplomacy, civil society, and political negotiations to help build common approaches to political solutions, to act as an advisory and lobbying group supporting mediation for peace and reconciliation, to increase the participation and perspectives of women at the peace table, to strengthen the relationships and factors that are working to foster peace in the local communities of both sides. They knew that the security of one depended on the other. However, the many successes we had were short-lived. Larger powers, and political forces armed with a violence we could not control destroyed what we had achieved. I heard the despair of one of the Israeli women leaders when I called her in Jerusalem just a few days ago. And this was what she said. And let me quote her. It was a better time, and yet we failed. What is the point of 1325 when the UN is full of aspirations but being dis disregarded uh, but toothless in action when norms and values of the UN are being disregarded even by the powerful. Now, I heard similar sentiments from Myanmar community leaders when I had to painfully tell them of my failure to help convene their need for an inclusive humanitarian forum just to discuss how to reach millions of people in areas of active conflict. We are on the preface on the preface the, 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 the uh, preface of no, of no return. The goals of peaceful coexistence and the rule of law are challenged by those who use violence and power over to dehumanize, to mobilize popular fear, to fuel a politics of division and hatred, to destroy the social fabric of human relationships based on mutual respect and power with. Military expenditure globally has reached a record high of US dollar 2.24 trillion in 2022. Arms control frameworks to prevent another world war have eroded. What is to be done? Mobilizing to end historical wrongs and new threats to humanity requires a collective effort akin to movements that eradicated slavery and colonialism, dismantled apartheid in South Africa 
and liberated Timor-Leste from occupation. The UN, as guardian of the, of the universal norms embedded in UN Charter, has been the main anchor of multilateral diplomacy in support of many of these struggles. It has used its legitimacy to convene and mobilize, building meaningful partnerships to address drivers and systems of injustice. However, the UN has been severely weakened and can no longer be the main actor. We have witnessed how the demands for ceasefires and unimpeded humanitarian access have been ignored or vetoed. Even the UN Secretary General, the world's top diplomat, has been ignored and disrespected. The UN remains an indispensable organization, but we can no longer depend on it to fix our problems and ensure peace and security for all. It is time to find new ways of working to keep the flame of hope and optimism alight in these dark times. We need to restore and rebuild the power of networks and social movements, alliances of people, especially women and youth, who are empowered by technology to build transnational communities based on shared values and shared purpose. Leaders must listen to voices of their people on matters of peace and security, and people must hold their leaders and institutions accountable for decisions, positions, and action. In conclusion, the impact of war on civilians, the erosion of international humanitarian law, and the failure of, dip of diplomacy demand our collective attention and action. To create a future free from the shackles of historical wrongs, we need courageous and principled leadership at all levels. More than ever, we must rekindle the flame of political diplomacy that builds cooperation for shared interests, recognizes the fundamental importance of the rule of war, reforms and empowers mechanisms to enforce human rights and international humanitarian law, and confronts the complicity that perpetuates human suffering. It is our moral imperative to do so to keep our humanity alive. Thank you, Richard. And Thank, you. Thank you very much, Nolene, not only for your diagnosis of the problem, but also uh, as you concluded with your suggestions of, of ways forward of finding new ways of, of thinking, something that we might want to um, pick up on at the end of our initial, initial um, interventions. I also want to take this opportunity to remind the audience that if you have questions, you can put them into the Q&A. We may be able to bring them into the discussion depending on whether we have time to do so. But I encourage you to do that if you'd like to ask any of the participants any any questions. So I'd like now to uh, turn to Ambassador Jorge Heine. Ambassador Heine is the former uh, Chilean ambassador to China, India, and South Africa, and now a research professor at the Party School of Global Studies and interim director of the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future at Boston University. And my question um, to you, Jorge, is the following. How and why should diplomacy change to respond to the challenges of our time? Thank you, Richard. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning to some. Uh, in the first place, let me thank the Oxford Global Society and Diplomats Without Borders for the opportunity to be here. Yes, uh, the world is in a bad place. Not one, but two wars. First in Ukraine, now in Gaza. The worst pandemic in a century climate change and its devastating effects, mass migration, a debt crisis in many developing countries, droughts and water scarcity almost everywhere. There's a reason why it's called holy crisis. So where is diplomacy when we need it? Why are diplomats not taking care of resolving this multiple crisis? What is wrong with what has been called the engine room of international relations? As we all know, if the engine room and the ship doesn't work, the ship comes to a halt. Before answering that question, though, let me submit to you that there is a reason why we find ourselves in this situation. This is not just uh, happenstances. These are not sort of random events that happen to coincide at this point in time. Crisis, Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci famously wrote, occurs when the old is dying and the new is not yet born. We find ourselves precisely in such a situation. The international system is in transition from the unipolar world 
of the post-Cold War period to one as yet unnamed in which power is more evenly distributed, where the global South plays a more significant role and where the certainties of the recent past no longer obtain. In this transition, there are no rules as the old system no longer exists and the new one has not yet emerged. Thus, the otherwise unthinkable situation in which a group like Hamas attacks the young men and women participating in a peace festival of all events, killing 250 of them on the one hand, and on the other, one in which the United States expresses its concern to Israel about the use of the bombs being used over Gaza City, saying that they are too big, and that Washington will be happy to provide somewhat smaller and medium-sized bombs that will be better suited for the purpose of urban carpet bombing. And I'm not making this up. This is what we are going through today. This would be unthinkable at any other moment in time. But this is the upended world in which we find ourselves. So the question becomes, what is the way forward? And how can we deal with this uh, tragic situation? This context, where is diplomacy when we need it? Obviously, the reasons for this shift is you know, largely structural. It has to do with what has been known as called the wealth shift, the World Bank's called the wealth shift from the North Atlantic to the Asia Pacific. In the global South, it's become a much more significant force in international affairs. There's one piece of data that reflects this uh, very well. Uh, today, in 2023, there are more billionaires in Beijing than in New York City, which illustrates this situation quite uh, dramatically. Now, there isn't much diplomats can do about those structural shifts, but diplomats could presumably help to manage this situation, this transition better, make it less bumpy, less rocky. Yet that is not happening. Why not? Uh, what is behind what has been referred to as the diplomatic malaise affecting the profession and ministries of foreign affairs more generally? Some years ago, at the height of the, of the current phase of globalization, I wrote that there was a curious paradox as globalization and the massive transborder trade, capital and communication flows that went with it obtained. This paradox was the following. Given the sheer magnitude of these transborder flows in so many areas, one would think that diplomats that act as veritable hinges of the international system, the ones that connect uh, home and host country, making many of these flows possible in the first place, would be hailed as the heroes of their time showered with recognitions of various kinds, with embassies and MFAs being granted significant budget increase, increases and otherwise being given all the facilities needed to do their job more effective. Yet, as we all know, none of that happened. And even at the height of the, of the globalization era, MFA budgets were being cut, diplomats derided, and the role minimized, if not more. As Peter Justinov once famously observed, diplomats were considered nothing but headwaiters who were occasionally allowed to sit. I argued then, and would argue now, that that was due to the fact that diplomacy had failed to reinvent itself and adapt to the new environment in which it found itself. Diplomacy was in many ways stuck in the past and unable to respond to the very different demands of the present, which required to go beyond the narrow confines of what I called club diplomacy. This reinvention entails first reaching out beyond the traditional role of representation to the projection of one's home country abroad, and second, reconnecting with citizens at home and realizing that less that is done, diplomacy will not be able to be effective, will not be able to get the sort of things done that it needs to do. But this adaptation to new realities is simply not happening. And I'm afraid this is true, not just for bilateral diplomacy, but also for multilateral diplomacy. I happen to be in New York City, on the third week of September, on the occasion of the meetings of the United Nations General Assembly, which is the occasion when many world leaders uh, participate in uh, those deliberations and give their um, opening speeches. Well, this year, of the five uh, heads of state of the P5 countries, only one attended the UNGA. Uh, a few days earlier, three, though, of them attended the G20 meeting held in uh, New Delhi in India. There's a message there about what many consider to be the growing irrelevance of the United Nations uh, and its inability to cope with world and global challenges, whereas other entities like the G20, like the BRICS, 
are emerging as more relevant, as more significant for addressing uh, these challenges. So we have international institutions that do not reflect the realities of today's world. And the paradox, again, is that even the beneficiaries of these obsolete arrangements, like the P5, realize that they are becoming less and less relevant and that the action has moved elsewhere. And it seems to me that we ought to keep in mind that diplomacy has become too much about talking points and too little about action plans. Too many meetings, too many diplomatic meetings start with denunciations of the counterpart sitting across the table. Hardly the best formula for success in any kind of negotiation. Grandstanding, rather than cooperating, rather than has become the coin of the real. There's a saying in the United States that in this country, people prefer the leaders to be strong and wrong rather than weak and right. Well, I'm afraid the same symptom seems to be pervading diplomacy. It is no longer about getting to yes, but about making it a show. Stagecraft has replaced statecraft. Diplomacy has become showbiz. Using the megaphone, as Sir Ivor Roberts commented, has become a real problem. Now, to be fair, not all of this is the fault of diplomats. In the end, they are beholden to their leaders. Much of the action of the international scene has become about domestic politics, not really about foreign policy. The result is the sort of debacles we are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, and they contribute to the present poly crisis. Yet, foreign policy and the setting in which it takes place has its own dynamics and imperatives, often radically different from those of domestic politics. As long as we continue down this path, disaster beckons. But I would argue that diplomats can still play a role in turning this around and put an end to this perverse dynamic that is leading the world down the garden path. This will take a monumental effort, but it needs to be done. Thank you. Jorge, thank you very much uh, for those comments. We'll come back maybe to the points you've made about the inadequacy of uh, institution, something that also you'd picked up on, uh, Nolene, but in both cases, you've identified uh, alternatives that, in your view, might be the basis for improving the effectiveness of, of diplomatic engagement in the uh, dealing with, uh, with, with armed conflict. But uh, before we do that, let's turn now to our fourth and final guest, uh, Mr. Gaith Al Omari. Mr. Al Omari is the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Senior Fellow at the Washington Institute for Nor uh, Near East Policy in Washington, D.C. From 1999 to 2006, he held various positions in the Palestinian Authority, in the PA, including as an advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team. And uh, Mr. Amari, I'd like to ask you more often than not, uh, diplomacy is about managing competing, sometimes even contradictory objectives. What are diplomats having to contend with in the current Israel-Hamas war? Over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Richard. And it's really an honor to be with my co-panelists. And it's a pleasure to be with my alma mater, Oxford, even, you know, across the ocean. Um, and yes, as you mentioned, I will focus on the uh, current war in uh, Gaza. Um, I will touch on some of the themes that my colleagues mentioned. I agree with some, disagree with uh, others. But before I go into the details, maybe a couple of preliminary uh, notes. First is, you know, diplomacy is extremely difficult during armed conflict. When the armed conflict is active, diplomacy is difficult for a number of reasons. The stakes are very high. Military logic prevails often more than the diplomatic uh, logic, but also the fact that, you know, what is possible and what is not possible often shifts based on the uh, developments on the ground. And military developments often dictate what is politically and diplomatically uh, uh, possible. And the second remark is that diplomacy is not really only about ending hostilities. That's at least not how I see it. I see diplomacy as a tool towards achieving and balancing numerous and often, as you mentioned, competing uh, uh, objectives. And the choices are often between bad and worse, not good and better. Just to give you a flavor of some of the issues that diplomats have to deal with in the current war, there's an issue of hostages that seems to be dealt with. There is the uh, need to make sure that this conflict does not militarily spill over 
into other uh, arenas in the region. There is a need to ensure that it does not politically destabilize other arenas. Think of Jordan and Egypt. Uh, there is a need to ensure that it does not append uh, existing peace treaties or uh, pr preclude the possibility of future peace treaties. These are all things that as diplomats, as we look at this, we have to take into account. But I will focus on three other elements that I see as immediate and direct impact on the conduct of, of, of hostilities and how uh, where it will go. And this is the need to limit and to balance rather uh, these three uh, uh, points. One is Israel's right to defend itself. At the end of the day, uh, I think there is no uh, doubt that no country should be expected to undergo what Israel uh, underwent on October 7th, that heinous terror attack by Hamas and not respond. It is uh, a right of a country to do that, uh, and failure to do that will set a very dangerous precedent when it comes to uh, terror uh, in the region. And that's why, you know, the idea of a ceasefire, appealing as it may sound on the face of it, actually presents some uh, serious policy uh, difficulties. The second obvious imperative is the need to mitigate harm to civilians. And I say mitigate, not eliminate, simply because, you know, the, role, the laws of war do not talk about eliminating, but rather how do you protect civilians to the extent possible. I will not go into great detail into this, enough to say that this is today one of the cornerstones of the world order as we understand that post-World War II, and this has to be a priority and a key imperative like any other uh, imperative. But the third one is the uh, need to position for the day after. At the end of the day, one thing that October 7th uh, uh, revealed is the fact that the status quo ante was inherently unstable. It produced a number of wars. Until today, we are dealing with what we are dealing with. So as diplomats, we have to look at how to deal with the day after. Now, I said a lot of these uh, balancing these issues requires trade-offs. And just to, again, I will go into each one of them and see how they interrelate and how sometimes you need to limit some of these objectives in order to achieve some of the other objectives. And let me start with the issue of Israel's uh, self-defense. I obviously, you know, as I mentioned, Israel has, like every other country, has the right to self-defense. Yet it's worth remembering that Israel may be the biggest military power in the region, but it's actually not a diplomatic heavyweight in the sense that it's a medium power, it's a sense that it's a power, it's a country that is uh, that who is limited, reasonably li or limited diplomatic relations, uh, etc. And Israel needs a diplomatic space in order to be able to achieve its military objectives. This is not the United States in Afghanistan, where you know we are a, a Security Council permanent members, and ultimately we have as much diplomatic space. Israel needs its allies to create its diplomatic space. However, the ability of the allies to create this diplomatic space to allow it to achieve its military objectives is very much dependent on the ability of those allies, whether it's in the US, uh, in Europe, etc., to demonstrate that Israel is doing everything possible to limit uh, uh, the humanitarian uh, suffering. Short of that, it becomes very hard to withstand the calls to end, uh, to create a ceasefire. This is why the administration here in the US, that's why Biden has been talking about respecting the laws of war, uh, talking about uh, uh, humanitarian pauses, etc. But also, in order to be able to, given, to be given the diplomatic space, Israel needs to articulate what is the end game. It's not enough to say that uh, Hamas has to be destroyed. Ultimately, nothing is worse than a vacuum. And unless there is some articulation of what is the end game, it's very hard to uh, maintain the diplomatic support for Israel to do its uh, uh, activities. Mitigation of civilian harm, you know, there is some obvious and less obvious uh, sides to it. The obvious is Israel needs to uh, respect international humanitarian law. Understanding that this is obviously not a simple matter, both as a, an operational matter, but also as a legal matter, because a lot of these rules are very uh, uh, elastic in some ways, open to interpretation, and there is no, you know, it's nice to talk about the ICC and others, but these are not really bodies that are functional, especially during the uh, uh, conduct of operations. What is more complicated is when it comes to Hamas, because internationally, you know, as diplomats, we are really trained and equipped to deal with state actors. When you deal with a non-state actor, it's very hard to use the levers that we have when it comes to uh, try uh, ensuring uh, respect for humanitarian law, whether it is uh, Hamas refraining from using its uh, placing its military assets in civilian areas, Hamas not firing uh, indiscriminately, etc. However, one can use proxy tools. Uh, Hamas has backers. Some are open to diplomatic uh, pressure. You know, Turkey, Qatar. Some are less so, but this is could be one of the tools that we can use. Yet 
one has to accept that as the operations, as the hostilities uh, uh, continue, our ability as diplomats to impact these two uh, elements are fairly limited. And I think we sometimes are most effective when we think longer term. And this is, I think, where uh, diplomats today can be most effective, which is the question of how do you shape the day after? And the first step to do that is to start by identifying what are the options and ranking these options in terms of desirability and, and uh, uh, um, practicability. Um, status quo, anti, obviously no one wants to go to that. We saw what it produced. Israeli occupying, no one, including most Israelis, don't want that. The Palestinian Authority coming back to rule Gaza, ideally the best situation, yet it is too discredited and too weak to do this. Today, the favorite, at least in diplomatic conversations, is having a third party uh, run this. Now, to do this, though, one has to start uh, preparing for that uh, for that eventuality right now. And that would require us to, first of all, uh, identify what is possible when it comes to this. Is it possible to convince countries to come and play a security role in such a politically and diplomatically uh, fraught situation? Many Arab diplomats that I've spoken to about this will say, you know, why walk into this uh, uh, shifting sand? Why walk into this quagmire? As we do this, though, as we try to identify who the actors are and what uh, are their interests, it's very important to identify what are the red lines of these actors that we should not even bother uh, pushing for wasting diplomatic capital on. You know, uh, there was an idea early on, for example, to have Egypt host many Palestinian refugees. It became very clear that e for Egypt, this is a red line and they mobilized their own and the regional diplomacy against it. And at a certain point, you have to realize uh, I'm not going to waste capital on this. Let's move to the next uh, option. Yet, don't take the words of your interlocutor for granted when it comes to what is a red line. As we all know, you always start uh, your negotiation high and one has to explore what are real red lines and what are basically expressions of concern. And if we hear expressions of concern, one has to start looking at, are there um, ways of allaying some of these concerns? For example, uh, you know, I know some, uh, some countries will be con uh, worried to come in and deal with a highly uh, 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 armed, highly trained and organized Hamas. Does this mean then that uh, uh, Israeli military action to degrade Hamas's capabilities is a, is a prerequisite maybe for this option? Um, sometimes I hear some countries saying we don't want to, you know, uh, come in, get stuck in Gaza, and suddenly this becomes our problem, not Israel's problem. Would having, for example, an American component of uh, a third party uh, be enough to reassure them? One has to start uh, looking at alternative ways of meeting some of the concerns expressed by one's uh, uh, counterparts. And finally, I would say, look at what are the diplomatic and political predicates that you need to lay in order to facilitate a day after. In other words, what are the political and diplomatic framings that your potential participants will need to justify and enable their own participation? I believe, for example, today in the, uh, uh, as we think of the day after, uh, no country will come in without being able to um, frame its participation as a step towards a two-state solution and uh, ending the conflict. At the end of the day, we understand that no one in the country wants to come and rule Gaza indefinitely, and therefore, we have to start talking about how do you rehabilitate, reform, and rebuild the Palestinian uh, Authority. And in all of this, I would go back to a theme that I think everyone has mentioned, avoid megaphone uh, diplomacy. Our job as diplomats today is to widen the options, not close the options. And sometimes if you make statements during the conduct of the war, it becomes very hard to walk them back and you have precluded some diplomatic possibilities and excluded some potential participants. So to conclude, I would say, as I look at the effectiveness of diplomacy and as I judge, judge diplomacy, it is really our ability to balance these three uh, uh, elements, our ability to basically make sure that the trade-offs are sufficient for each of these elements to be achieved and not to, to overdo one of these elements at the expense of the others, because in the end of the day, you will end up with a lopsided uh, new reality that in itself will include the, 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 you know, the seeds of its own of the next uh, crisis. And thank you. Looking forward to the conversation. Okay. Thank you very, very much again, not only for highlighting the difficulties, but also for suggesting constructive, potentially constructive ways of, of thinking about ways forward. Now, before I give the participants an opportunity perhaps to comment on one another's opening remarks. There have been some very interesting questions that have been put uh, to you from members of the audience. And if you don't mind, I'll, uh, I'll ask you to reflect on uh, some of these, any of those who wish to. 
Uh, there was a uh, question raised about the potential role of uh, track two diplomacy or track three diplomacy, even uh, the role of people to people dialogues uh, involving women, youth, and men uh, in uh, um, uh, the the um, armed conflicts that we've been discussing. Obviously, there's a history of the use, um, uh, sometimes very effectively of for um, uh, track two diplomacy. So I'm, I'd like to ask if uh, in this particular, in the context of, and we've been talking largely about uh, the, the war in Israel-Gaza, um, but again, to remind us as um, Ivor did from the outset, there are more than 30 countries embroiled in armed conflict across the globe at this moment. They don't get the same attention. Uh, consistently as uh, do the ones that are dominating the news at the, at, at the moment, including U Ukraine, Russia. But broadly speaking, is this a tool, a diplomatic tool that is underused uh, or is its uh, potential really quite uh, limited, especially with respect to some of the more in intractable conflicts that we're talking about. So if any one of you would like to reflect a little bit on the uh, the, the potential for track two diplomacy to make uh, a, a bigger difference, please do. Um, Nolene, is that something that you might wish to weigh in on? Well, I, uh, I could talk a little bit about it uh, by saying that uh, we, I have brought many women together um, from uh, in countries affected by conflict. And they have obviously been participating and unfortunately mainly along the track two uh, process. But one of the major concerns that we have is that their voices are not heard in the formal peace table. And uh, it's usually we normally see the warlords who are invited. And as though the, that uh, at the end of the day, the discussions are actually the ceasefire, or uh, it is uh, putting down of guns and so on. And there's power sharing among men with guns, uh, if I can put it like that. And there is a lot of frustration uh, about the kind of linkage of realities at the ground level, the lack of recognition of community uh, leaders who are trying to build peace at the local level, and many of them are not heard, even though there are all these informal people-to-people -people exchanges. And I think that that is something, I, uh, one of the things that I've been able to do is to make sure that when it is, for example, a, a process that's within the framework of the United Nations, that all the SRSGs, the Secretary General Special representatives and envoys would actually meet with the local population. And I think the point is made was made uh, very well by saying that it cannot just be talks and talks without linking it to the lived realities of people at the ground and what is being done at the ground to make a difference. Because at the end of the day, peace can only be held in sustain what we call sustainable peace can only be held if it is done within the framework of a reset uh, uh, of governance structures, of a reset of more inclusiveness, and so on. And I think that many of the talks that I've seen in the, uh, in, uh, among the people to, to, to people uh, kind of diplomacy is the fact that they dare to address these root causes of violence and to put it on the table. And that sometimes this is not addressed in very much the way that we would like to see. And that's why many of the conflicts reoccur. And if you look at the number of conflicts that reoccur on the Security Council agenda, sometimes it's less than five years. And I think we need to look at what brings about sustainable peace and security. If, if I may, uh, just a couple of, uh, of comments. And Please. here, again, I mean, I, I would differentiate between track two and people to people. And I think both have very different uh, roles to play. I think at... At this moment, track two is essential. It's essential because there are certain things that you simply cannot discuss in track one. There are ideas that if you float in track one, will have to be shut down immediately because of diplomatic positions, uh, etc. And this is really the value today of a track two where you can actually test some of these uh, ideas with a degree of deniability. And I find these to be essential at a time of an active uh, conflict. This is a time, frankly, you know, you know, uh, 
we have to be talking to men with guns because the ones who are conducting the uh, attacks and the fire and the fighting are men with guns. And this is, if you look at the immediate uh, uh, priority, is to de-escalate, then uh, these are the addresses. However, I do believe that as you think of the day after and creating the stability of the day after, you know, we have to look at why are these wars uh, recurring? And a big part of it is that uh, many constituencies feel uh, disaffected. This is not the only reason. There are, at the end of the day, national security imperatives, uh, etc. Yet, I believe as one starts looking at the day after, I can tell you, I can focus on the Palestinian case and tell you that uh, the lack of political accountability and the lack of a political space and lack of a mechanism for various uh, uh, voices to express themselves has led to a situation where a movement like Hamas can simply make a decision to go and uh, conduct a terror attack, knowing very well that tens of thousands of Palestinian civilians will be killed with zero accountability. So as I think, as you want to create a stable structure in the day after, certainly the issue of how do you engage these different voices, how do you give them a stake in the day after arrangements is key to create the kind of stabilization that you need to ensure there is no recurrence as we deal with the other kind of national security and high diplomacy component of the conflict. Thanks, Keith. Would anyone else like to weigh in on this uh, topic of uh, track two alternative for uh, outside the um, high-level official uh, and any uh, value, again, in relation to conflicts underway. If not, uh, there was also a question, very interesting question, uh, about the role of the Secretary General and whether the Secretary General, despite uh, his outspokenness uh, in in these times, uh, is he not taking full advantage of some of the um, uh, potential of his position, Article 99 of the UN uh, Charter uh, gives him the opportunity to bring matters to the uh, attention of the the, the Security Council uh, unilaterally. Uh, there's also greater scope, arguably, and we have seen this, I think, with the uh, Ukraine-Russia war for the General Assembly to play a more significant role. Are the instruments of the, General, the Secretary General, the General Assembly of the United Nations, uh, are they being underutilized? I mean, notwithstanding what you had to say, Nolene, about the inadequacy of these institutions, um, uh, are, are there possibilities that we're not exploiting, that are not being exploited uh, within the even just the UN system? Anyone want to comment on that? Yes, Ivor, please. Um, thank you. Um, well, I think if we try and work with the system that we have rather than the system that we would like to have. I mean, I think the prospect of reforming the way the UN works is a, is a you know, work in progress that's been going on for decades without any great success. But we have to try and work with what we have. And I wonder whether, given the fact that the UN Secretary General is limited to in in not necessarily in rhetorical terms, but in action terms in what he can do, we should look at what the UN might be able to do. And, and in re returning to Mr. al Omari's questions about the day after, which I think is the crucial question in that we've, we've obviously been focusing on Israel-Palestine. Is there a role for a, a UN mandate in a temporary sense in Gaza? A, a trusteeship which would allow space and time for the Palestinian Authority to build up its position in Gaza as well as its position in the West Bank. Uh, it would um, fill a void, and that's what I think w we all agree is something that's to be avoided in Gaza, where let us assume that Hamas as a military outfit is eliminated by the Israelis, and I find it very hard to imagine circumstances where they would now withdraw from Gaza without having achieved a very high degree of um, dis dismemberment of the um, Hamas structures. Um, so the, the Palestinian Authority is not in a position to walk into Gaza and say, leave it all to us. Uh, individual Arab states, neighboring states, would regard it as the ultimate poison chalice, I think. And they would say, we don't have the legitimacy, we don't have the, you know, we were, I mean, after all, Jordan and Lebanon both have had the Palestinians 
in their hearth, as it were, and got rid of them on both occasions. So they are not going to walk into that uh, without a structure, an international structure where they have legitimacy. Now, if you want to create a UN trusteeship, who is going to lead it? And it has to be, I think, a sort of joint leadership, which will have the support of is Israel. And I don't think Israel would allow anyone else but the United States to have some role in it and a substantial Arab League component on the other. It would have to be a jointly led operation. The ultimate goal, I see it, is a return to Oslo and what was dismantled by the, in the, in, by the assassination of um, Prime Minister Rabin, which to me is one of the greatest disasters um, of the last 50 years in terms of the Arab-Israel question. It's depressing indeed that um, I think Ms. some of Mr. Netanyahu's supporters in Israel have been saying that Rabin is responsible for what has happened in uh, the attacks by Hamas, when in fact I think uh, any real objective assessment would say that that, that, that was the nearest we came to a, a, a solution to the to the whole problem. Um, it's not going to be easy to get there, but I think rather than assume that the UN is hopeless and can't achieve anything, there is a path which the UN can take. And I think that's one we should try and work towards. Thanks very much, Ivor. Um, I'm wondering, there's been, uh, there have been meetings. We had one um, uh, recently, Saudi Arabia, with largely Arab states uh, uh, attending. Uh, I'm thinking about your idea for trusteeship and how or any of the larger proposals that are being put forward that, um, as uh, Gaith had said, would be able to deal with the the day after. Is is there a scope then for maybe conference diplomacy? I mean, there haven't been uh, both with regard to the Israel Gaza, Russia, Ukraine efforts at, at conference diplomacy as opposed to shuttle and more unilateral, bilateral uh, efforts. Uh, uh, historically, conference diplomacy has sometimes yielded positive results. Is that something that we should be uh, looking at? There have been historically, at least with regard to Israel, Palestine, Israel, Arab countries, conferences. Um, indeed, what you described, the Oslo process, in some ways, um, also was uh, emerged from conference. Madrid um, helped to, um, I think, support that initiative. So is this something that uh, could get any positive traction, something that we should be also be encouraging, or is it a dead end at the, the current context? Anyone have any thoughts on scope? Yes. For, for, <clears throat> yeah? Let me weigh in. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a very good uh, idea. It seems to me that part of the problem that we have seen in the current conflicts in Ukraine and also now in Israel Gaza is this uh, attitude of, you know, again, megaphone diplomacy and sort of countries siding either with one or the other party. That is not the question. The question is, how do we get out of this current uh, predicament? And in that sense, it seems to me, conference diplomacy, which would allow for a variety of voices uh, to be heard and uh, bring together this uh, growing gap that we are seeing between you know uh, the north between the g7 and uh, the global south uh, both in the case of ukraine and in the case of gaza israel now whether that might be bridged and one look uh, might look for ways in which a satisfactory solution uh, might emerge so i think it's a very it's a very sound idea uh, we'll see whether it would gain traction but i think it's a very sound idea other thoughts related to yeah. this case? if if i may and again i will i'm i'm just talking about the gaza conflict here so uh, not in generalities but uh, i'd be very careful with uh, conference diplomacy and i would identify and define in uh, you know before i go there what is the objective if the objective is to actually find the solution, then I would argue that conference diplomacy is not the way to go in this particular context. I mean, we saw it in the Arab League and the Islamic uh, uh, meeting in uh, Saudi on the 11th. The nature of these kind of uh, things is that you bring sometimes actors with no actual equities in the uh, game and they simply it becomes simply a, st a stage for grandstanding and for posturing. You know, why do I need Algeria? 
um, in, in this. Uh, why do I need Bashar al-Assad to come and tell me about uh, respecting human rights uh, in these kinds of conferences? So for that purpose, I think uh, it is not useful. But I think it's useful once you have the main uh, stakeholders identify the general direction they want to go uh, in. And in this particular case, I would say the main stakeholders would be the Palestinians, the Israelis, the U.S., uh, the key Arab countries, uh, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi, and some of uh, those. And once I have that, I would look at conference diplomacy, both as a way of getting buy-in from uh, some of the other kind of, you know, second and third tier uh, actors, but uh, also, frankly, to give the point that Ivor mentioned, to give the kind of chapeau, the uh, legitimacy for some of these countries that uh, do not feel politically or diplomatically secure enough to go in on a bilateral or kind of, you know, coalition of the willing uh, uh, basis. So I would, again, I, my answer to you would be, what do you hope to achieve from conference diplomacy? Use it as a tool, not as an end. Thanks very much. Nalin, did you want to weigh in on this as yes. well? Uh, yes, uh, very, very quickly. I, I just want to stress that the role of a secretary general has been very interesting. I think from the very start of his career, of, of his term, he stressed very much on prevention preventive diplomacy, and the need to actually invest in the infrastructure of peace and what that would look like. And I think that that's something to pay high attention to. And of course, we are very reflective uh, as a UN on where we have done right and where we have gone wrong. And I think that that kind of reflection is absolutely critical. And that's why he's also coming up with his new agenda for peace, which will be discussed uh, in the next, hopefully uh, in the next uh, 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 GA meeting. And, and, and here, the emphasis is that we realize that as a UN, we can't play the main role all the time. I mean, the, the, the funding to the UN is, is insufficient. Just look at what's happening to the humanitarian pillar of the UN itself. And therefore, uh, what we need are genuine partnerships. And he has built up the, the need for, of diplomacy for peace, but also the, the, the need to deal with regional organizations and the, and, and, and the, and the importance of bringing uh, partners who can make a difference and to leverage that and to leverage what can be leveraged from the UN side. And I think that what he has done with his food grain initiative for the Ukraine, it has made a huge difference uh, economically for many countries and prevented a food uh, security crisis uh, globally as well. So there's a lot that we can do and we are doing, but I, the main disappointment is the fact that we can't do more <laughs> given the current tensions and what's happening uh, in, the, uh, in the Security Council, even at the time of the, of the pandemic, and this is because it is a divided Security Council, given the, the geopolitics of, of what we are experiencing as we move towards a multipolar world. But at the same time, uh, even if the Security Council cannot come up with a, a, a resolution to take action, the General Assembly has actually been able to, to uh, combine and to make a stand on things from the Ukraine issue all the way to the Palestinian, uh, Gaza issue, and so on. So again, there are many leverages uh, or, or that can be used uh, by, by, by the, the UN. And also what we did in Timor-Leste. I mean, when there was a concern, the UN went in and administrated the country until it was ready to be given to, to leaders um, that could actually take over. So there are many examples, uh, but at the same time, the, the, I think what is so frustrating is the fact that the crisis in the world are so numerous and we don't have that bandwidth to attend to the same, to the crisis in the same way. And, and I think in this process, Myanmar, for example, has fallen right at the bottom, uh, uh, unfortunately, especially the Rohingya situation. And, and, and that has been extremely painful for me to watch. Thank you. Thank you very much. I recognize that we are out of time. There were a number of other very interesting questions, comments from the members of the audience. And I'm sorry that we won't have the opportunity to uh, address them. Um, I'm sorry also that we won't be able to uh, continue the conversation, which has been very, very interesting. I'd like to thank our guests um, today for your very, very thoughtful 
reflections and to our audience. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you.